So uh, let's kick things off today. I'd like to just welcome everyone and, and thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you might be joining us from today. Um, we're happy to have you with us for our, our webinar entitled Democratizing Clinical Research, Scaling, Access and Inclusion. This is a, an area that's long overdue for um, more in-depth conversations and progress. We're, we're looking forward to, um, to sharing some perspectives with you today and also gathering a little bit of your input as well through some polling questions that we'll cover as we go through um, our session. Also have an absolutely amazing panel with us today sharing a variety of different perspectives related to, to access and inclusion in clinical research. And of course, this is all occurring uh, at a pretty dynamic time in the world of clinical development um, with COVID serving as an accelerant for so many innovations that we're seeing. So this will be very interesting, I think, and hopefully insightful and helpful for, for all of our attendees. So let's, let's move ahead. If we could move to the next slide, please. Thank you. We'll do introductions here in just a moment, just to give you a sense of what we have ahead of us over the next hour. This is our agenda. Um, I'll introduce myself and our panelists. We'll then get started with a polling question for our attendees to, uh, to get a sense of um, uh, where you join us from and, and what type of organization you're primarily uh, affiliated with. Then we'll share a little bit of data and we'll talk a little bit about the current state of affairs in clinical development, both with regards to sort of the, 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 uh, the drug development paradigm that we're operating within and also on the, the success or rather lack thereof uh, of that paradigm being able to provide access to underrepresented communities. We'll also have a couple other polling questions for you scattered throughout. And then really, I think the facilitated conversation we'd like to have um, should be the most sort of insightful, interesting part of our day. And then we'll, we'll wrap up with a couple closing statements. So let's move ahead to the next slide and, and we'll, we'll get everyone introduced and, and get moving today. Great, thank you. Um, so my name is Scott Schliebner. I'm Senior Vice President of Scientific Affairs at PRA Health Sciences. PRA is a a global CRO, a global healthcare intelligence organization. Uh, I started our Center for Rare Diseases about eight years ago, uh, focusing on the need, um, recognizing the need that, that, cl that clinical research in the rare disease space really required some different approaches. And it's really served as a little bit of an innovation lab for um, operating in a different manner and, and being able to incorporate innovations that I think are very applicable to engaging underrepresented populations, for example, um, and also for just uh, providing access for people um, wherever they may live, um, wherever they may be. Then the panelists were joined with, again, this is the exciting part here. So um, Dr. Tanisha Washington, Dr. Washington is the founder of the Washington Group. Uh, she also leads a diversity initiative at RareX and is a professor at the University of Alabama, Birmingham School of Public Health. Uh, her current research focuses on community engagement efforts uh, via the mentor program. I'm very excited to have Dr. Washington with us today. Uh, we're also joined by Veer Mehta. Veer is the founder and CEO of Halo Health Systems, a digital platform that accelerates clinical trials for biopharmaceutical companies. Veer has a passion for improving patient centricity in healthcare and is focused on improving the lives of patients, clinicians, and researchers everywhere. And then last but not least, Ms. Fields, Jennifer Fields is the founder and president of the Hills Tandem. Jennifer works with uh, nonprofit organizations as a change agent to improve organizational impact. She also works with biopharmaceutical companies to improve how we engage and work directly with patients. Uh, Jennifer is also very active within the sickle cell disease community and we're thrilled to have her join us and share her perspectives with us today as well. So that's our fantastic panel. Why don't we move ahead forward and let's, um, let's launch our first polling question to the audience. Thank you in advance for reviewing this and, um, and responding. We look forward to having a little bit of interaction with you throughout the session today. 
This is where we need to insert the Jeopardy music. <clears throat> All right, I assume we're getting some responses there. Drum roll. All right, here we are. Excellent. Thanks everyone for contributing here. So it looks like we, uh, we've got 31% of our attendees look like they're from a, a biopharma, biotech pharmaceutical company. Um, followed by 21% um, from clinical sites, academic medical centers, that's fantastic. We also have some other niche providers. We have a few other CRO colleagues. We have only have a couple patients or patient advocates with us today, it looks like. Um, so that's great, okay. That gives us a little bit of a sense that we do have a diverse breakdown um, of our attendees. So thank you for that. And See if I can close, excellent. Okay, um, I would also like to, to mention, we'll have a couple more polling questions throughout today's session. In the meantime, if you have questions um, on the contents or questions for our panelists, please uh, down below, um, use the Q&A tab uh, to propose your question. We would love to field as many of these as we can. We'll have some dedicated time at the very end of our session to go over audience questions, but we'll also keep an eye on that Q&A tab and try to sprinkle in a couple throughout our conversation here today. Okay, so with that, let's move forward to uh, the current state of affairs and cover just a couple pieces of, a uh, couple metrics if we can by, by moving to the next slide. Thank you. Okay, so this slide um, really outlines what I would consider to be the traditional drug development paradigm, how we've been operating in clinical research for, for several decades um, that really hasn't evolved very much. And so, you know, very quickly, if you were to start in the upper left where this says approved protocol and kind of follow this flow around clockwise, um, this highlights how we tend to design and conduct clinical trials. And I think there's a couple important facets of this that are worth pointing out. So once, um, once a bio, uh, biotech pharmaceutical company approves a protocol, which is often done internally and sometimes doesn't necessarily involve a lot of external stakeholders, we then typically move that protocol out to clinical sites and we recruit investigators and investigative sites to participate in that study. And we send the protocol to them. And we, of course, we start moving through their ethics um, and IRB approval process. From there, once we have a, a protocol open and a study approved at a clinical site, then we begin to reach out to participants we're screening and enrolling participants, looking for um, relevant, uh, appropriate patients. As study enrolls and, and patients um, participate and, and stay on through a study, data is entered and reviewed. We just continue flowing through here where data is analyzed, presented and published. Ultimately, we're hoping that data is filed and new therapies are approved. Um, so this sort of clockwise cycle is typically how we've operated in clinical research. And I think it's kind of important to point out that this has not really evolved much since the 70s. Um, although in the year 2021, we're starting to see this kind of turned on its head a little bit. So let's move ahead to the next slide. So what's wrong with this traditional picture I painted, this flow of finalizing a protocol and then rolling it out to clinical sites and then starting to recruit patients? Um, well, I think there's several problems with this paradigm that need updating um, and need to sort of move into the 21st century with us. So first off, the protocols are designed and approved. You know, was the study actually um, designed with any input from clinical site staff or from patients themselves? We often roll clinical studies out to sites and then find later on that the schedule of evaluations doesn't really work within their clinical workflow at their hospital or clinic or that what we're asking of patients isn't realistic. And oftentimes these protocols, again, are, are finalized and developed without any of that input whatsoever. For those of you who work in clinical development, the schedule of assessments or schedule of evaluations is really the nuts and bolts of a study that shows what evaluations will occur and at what time points. A lot of times we're looking to collect as much interesting data as we want. Sometimes it's exploratory endpoints that we we don't even really sometimes know what we're going to do with that data, but we know we want to collect that data 
for the future. This results in a schedule of assessments that sometimes is very unrealistic and overly burdensome for patients to complete all of these pieces. Thirdly, moving downward, do these patients actually exist within these protocols that we finalize, sometimes within a bubble, we outline a variety of eligibility criteria, inclusion and exclusion criterion to create a controlled population of sorts, um, a well-defined sample that is usually not representative, but sometimes when we do this, we overthink these eligibility criteria and we look for such a narrow patient that must check off all of these criterion that the patients don't actually even exist. And then sometimes we wonder why our clinical studies are a little behind in enrollment um, because we're trying to enroll patients that really cannot even meet all of these criteria. Um, then moving over to the other column, you know, does the study itself even appeal to patients? Um, are the endpoints measuring things that are relevant to patients? Um, does the schedule of evaluations and requirements, um, is it realistic for families or patients or caregivers or parents or children to actually um, participate in? And then lastly, really the biggest, the biggest point we try to hammer home when we think about this archaic protocol clinical drug delivery paradigm is trying to think about how burdensome this study will be for patients. Instead of trying to collect every data point that we might want, or instead of developing a protocol not in a bubble, um, we need to be thinking about our ultimate stakeholders, patients and participants, and thinking about if we're asking them to do something that's realistic. So why can't we just continue to do things the way we always have? Why should we be concerned about these problems and these challenges? I'd like to share a couple metrics on the next slide, if we could jump ahead. Thank you. So the, the clinical landscape that we see out here today, on the left, you'll see some metrics here. This is what we're seeing globally in all clinical trials. And to the right is the impact of these. So why should we be doing something different with our drug development paradigm? Well, for example, every year we now need 40 million patients um, for over 300,000 clinical trials each year. Every year there are more clinical trials requiring more patients. And given our paradigm that we're operating from, we see that a full half of all of these clinical studies are delayed due to patient recruitment. We also have identified that the far majority of patients live more than two hours from our traditional research site or traditional academic medical center. As a result, um, even when we do have patients enroll and get over the hurdle of traveling to and from a site, more than 30% of those patients drop out, preventing us from really um, gathering long-term safety data and maybe having to replace those patients and extend a study. The travel to and from a site, as we're hinting at, is really the most significant burden that we see, specifically for rare disease patients, but even when we extend that out into other disease states, travel to and from is challenging. And this, of course, results in delays across the entire program. Lastly, our current paradigm results really in a disproportionate amount of Caucasian participants. The majority of clinical trial participants look like me. They're middle-aged Caucasian men. What's the problem with that? Well, we don't have representative clinical trials. We're not providing equal access. And at the end of the day, it's not even good science to be conducting clinical trials this way. So there's a lot of metrics out there right now that really suggest the way we're operating isn't sustainable, and the way we're operating isn't thinking about patients, and nor is it resulting in really representative participants within our clinical studies. So there's some challenges here. We could move forward to the next slide. Thank you. Real quick, the last slide on some data before we jump into our conversation. As you see here, under representation in clinical research, you can see um, this is within the U.S. specifically, but you know, different ethnic groups listed in the first column. And for African-Americans, for example, you can see that making up approximately 13% of the U.S. population, yet only 5% of African-American uh, patients are participating in clinical trials. It's, running a, it's really a dramatic underrepresentation within that population. It's actually even a little worse in the Latinx communities where um, they make up a, a little bit more significant portion of the population and only 1% of these patients um, are participating in trials. And then of course, no surprise, we see the opposite. We see the flip side of that 
with our Caucasian uh, participants making up two thirds of the country, yet they're the far majority of our participants. So this is what we're seeing, and this is what our clinical trial paradigm has kind of produced. And this is the result of you know, some history. This is the result of trust or lack thereof. So as you see these numbers, you can see that, that the Latinx and African-American communities are most underrepresented. And a couple examples really is, again, why is this important? Why is this not just doing the right thing? Well, from a purely scientific perspective, we have a few drugs out there that we know of that only work specifically with um, particular ethnic groups. For example, the blood thinner Plavix is not effective in 75% of Pacific Islanders as their bodies don't actually produce the appropriate enzyme to activate this drug. So if we are to study that um, drug in a disrepresentative population, we might not even know about its ineffectiveness in certain ethnic groups until we include them in a study. Similarly for the uh, oncology agent Aressa, um, it's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Um, there's some specific patient populations like Asian, Asian women who are non-smokers and have a particular uh, epidermal growth factor receptor mutation um, where this drug could work very well or not at all. And if we don't actually think through that and we only enroll Caucasian men in a study, we'll never actually even under, under, understand that or get to that conclusion. So really the summary here is that our current paradigm doesn't work in a lot of ways. It's resulting in trials being delayed it's resulting in us not being able to keep up with the number of studies that come out each year. And we're of course not uh, producing representative clinical trials at all. So a lot of reasons we need to be thinking differently, a lot of reasons we need to change the way we engage with patients. And um, I hope that this data here on the slide provides a little foundation for the, the conversation we're going to kick off here next. So let's, uh, let's move forward to um, our next slide, which I believe will have um, um, facilitated conversation here. I don't know if we have a polling question right now. If not, we will get started. Okay, here we are. Well, we, that's our first one. If our second question is available for polling, let's pop that up. And if not, we'll jump into our first question with our panel. That's our first one again. All right, why don't we get started with our facilitated conversation because the panelists here, this is really who we wanna be hearing from today. We'll ask a polling question of our audience here in a little bit when we get a moment, but why don't we start off with a, a question. So we've, we've talked a little bit about the clinical drug you know, development paradigm being old and archaic. Um, it not working in, in, in a variety of manners. Um, so I guess really the first question here is, how do we better define diversity in clinical trials and why is this needed to improve participation? Tanisha, would you like to get us started with this one? Sure, I, Scott, I hope you can hear me well. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much again, Scott, for having um, this conversation today. Very important for each of us. And I think um, I want to also thank everyone who's joining in. I think, uh, and I, I love the question just because I think there's so many, um, there's so much diversity in the response. I think when we traditionally thought about diversity, I know for me, I'll admit, you know, it's been that typical black white conversation, you know, and I think that has evolved so much where now we're realizing that diversity encompasses so much more um, than just that black and white space. And I think you hit it, Scott, in your slides, the idea of um, individuals that are Asian, Latinx community. Um, I also think when you think outside of that, um, you can think about people that have disabilities, um, specifically um, individuals that have specific rare diseases, um, gender differences. Um, I would even say um, sexual, uh, sexual um, differences as far as how people identify themselves. So I think it's a broad scope of how um, diversity lends itself in the conversation now. And I won't take uh, all of that away and I'll let some of the other um, individuals speak as well. Sure, I, I'd like to add to that. I think, so the definition for me of diversity is growing. It's broad already, but it's growing. 
Um, and I think, for example, when you talk about defining diversity, if you think about subcultures within a race, right? So just because someone is of darker skin tone doesn't mean that they're, or African American, doesn't mean that they are, you know, all from America for the past few generations. Um, they could be from Nigeria, they could be from Haiti, they could be from, but if you break that down even further and you look at the cultures within those different groups, then there are specific um, identifiers um, that I think are to be considered when you're looking at um, clinical trials and how to engage um, different communities. And I think that we could definitely do a better job at that. Um, and I think it's, it's about being intentional with, with who those people are, um, our target audiences, and then also looking at the preclinical phase. If you're in the preclinical phase, to me, that's when we should really engage the patient community or the target patient community. I know you're still trying everything out, but, and the resources should be put behind that to, you know, to investigate who those cultures are. Um, one quick thing before I slide to my, my colleague, um, one of the things that stood out to me is um, I suffer, I live with sickle cell disease, but I also have, of course, iron deficiency um, because I haven't had a lot of transfusions. <laughs> um, and I was looking for iron solutions and I came across a study about, uh, from researchers from Canada. And they noticed that in their, their research studies that they were in a village of Cambodia. Um, and there are a lot of women there who suffer from iron deficiency anemia. And they wanted to address that issue. But one of the things that they tried to do was, you know, cast iron, cook with cast iron, um, but the women couldn't afford cast iron. And then it was, okay, well, let's make this iron chunk of um, iron, you know, thing to cook with, right? And they made the shape of a flower. They didn't like flowers or they didn't think anything special about these flowers, so they didn't use those. But then if you think about, they talked to the village chief, right? The village chief said, well, for us, a fish is lucky. So they made, they remade the shape of these fish uh, or these iron blocks into fish, and then the women started using it, and they were able to decrease the iron deficiency anemia in those people. But that's just an example of, I think that's how we need to approach uh, clinical trials. Great example. Yeah, just a, a couple of comments here um, to, to add to the uh, great feedback that we received from the other panelists. Um, you know, it is a, a tough questions in terms of how we define diversity. Um, and I think it does have um, multiple aspects um, that need to be considered, um, including, you know, social, cultural diversity. Um, the couple points maybe I would add here is um, to also look at the diversity from a population standpoint. Um, you know, considerations for pediatric and geriatric populations is something that we should look at um, as part of the drug development process. Um, and then sort of the follow-up comment um, or an additional comment is also looking at um, indication-specific considerations. And so, you know, if, if we um, take an example of a chronic condition, um, that disproportionately um, impacts a certain population that is something that needs to be considered as part of the trial design and the targets that you set for diversity. Um, a good example of that would be diabetes, um, you know, where you have 60% more African Americans um, that would have prevalence for diabetes. So those are just a couple of points I wanted to add. Great points. Great points, especially true in the, the field of sickle cell disease that Jennifer is really active in, um, especially relevant for things like that. I think that's important. Um, thank you guys for your thoughts. Um, so we're trying to define diversity. We're going to pull our audience here at some point when we're ready um, to get their perspective on how one they would define diversity or what's the first thing they think about. Um, but in the meantime, um, Back to clinical development and clinical trials. Um, there's a lot of barriers to participation. Um, Jennifer, maybe you could get, kick us off here in terms of what you see with the populations you work with. You know, what, are the, what are the main barriers that you see preventing people from enrolling or participating in clinical research? Sure, I can kick this one off. Um, <clears throat> that kind of, to me, that triggers my thoughts back to the last comments about diversity, right? So it depends on the population and what you know, who you're serving or who you're targeting. Um, I think that defines um, what the barriers are. Um, but, you know, just based on my experience and working heavily with sickle cell and beta valve, um, I think a lot of the barriers that we've addressed and also working with our nonprofit groups is their financial resources. Um, those are barriers. Right now, COVID-19 presents another whole slew of barriers um, with 
lack of access to funding, finances, resources. They can't, people can't fill their prescriptions. Um, they can't meet the basic needs. And if you can't meet the basic needs, then they're not even going to consider thinking about a clinical trial. Um, one of my, just a quick kind of note is that one of my um, clients serves people with sickle cell disease and they were asked by a community health worker, um, why did you miss your appointment? And the response was because I didn't have money to make, to, to go to the laundromat to clean my clothes. So it was just a barrier to care. So I think there are so many of them um, and just the basic needs, I think are the biggest barrier of meeting those basic needs of a population. Good point. Great point. Basic needs, it's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If we don't take care of our basic things first, it's hard to sort of add on to that, especially with families that are already struggling with a particular disease state. Um, Tanisha, anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, and I think I look at it, um, I think those were great points, Jennifer. Um, outside of that, I think for me, um, dealing with more so community engaged work and community, I think it's a complete lack of um, understanding about the clinical trial process. Um, and I think coupled with the distrust that specific communities already have um, in research specifically, um, just because of the history around, you know, clinical trials and the processes. And I want to, you know, make sure we, we note that a lot of these different projects were recent. So, you know, in my mind, recent, you know, years, a couple of years ago. Um, so people aren't really understanding. They have a disconnect. What does a clinical trial mean? And especially, as you mentioned, Scott, previously, when people aren't added to the conversation at the beginning, I think it kind of facilitates another level um, of miseducation. So I think if we could identify, again, those barriers that Jennifer mentioned, but also uh, get at that lack of understanding of what a clinical trial process looks like. Um, and you did it beautifully in a prior slide, but I think even understanding that a lot of those things you're not able to do anymore. You're not able to mislead someone about a lot of the clinical process because the IRB takes care of that. But if people don't even know what an IRB is, an institutional review board, you know, how do they understand that those little, you know, those little areas are in that process to kind of stop those unethical things that are happening or have happened um, in the clinical process? And then I'll, I'll leave the rest for here. Uh, great comments. Great comments. Yeah. Um, just a couple of things maybe I can um, add here. Um, and I think, Scott, you alluded to this as part of your previous slides. Um, I think we should definitely look at um, how onerous the schedule of assessments are. You know, I think everything starts uh, with the clinical protocol. And as we are, um, you know, gearing up for sort of next set of studies, um, taking some of these um, into considerations, um, I, I think is definitely needed. Also looking at, um, you know, the complex inclusion exclusion criteria that you also alluded to and looking at opportunities to uh, minimize travel. Um, the one other thing that maybe I, I can add um, here is also to look at, uh, you know, less invasive measures as part of your assessments. Um, a, a good example that maybe comes to mind is if you're looking at endocrinology as a therapeutic area and you're looking at NASH as an indication um, where you're trying to determine the level of cirrhosis in the liver, um, do you have to go down the path of a liver biopsy? Are you able to use alternate technology that is less invasive? Can you use ultrasound? Can you use something like a fiber scan? Um, that might also help to maybe impact, uh, you know, the level of participation that you're seeing in the studies. Great points. Yeah, I think that schedule of evaluations, it comes down to that really, really that is the core of a study and that really reflects what we're asking participants to, to do. And, you know, the, the, the older school thought is, you know, if you build it, they will come. You know, if we Put this clinical trial out there. Um, patients will travel, you know, far and wide to participate. Um, they won't mind having, um, you know, four lumbar punctures. They'll be excited to get access to this drug. And and while a lot of patient communities, as you guys know, are really looking at clinical trials as their only hope and their only source of a new treatment because standard of care is insufficient. Um, patients also have choices, right? And 
mm -hmm. we need to be thinking about that um, the design and the burden that we're building into studies. Because as we saw from the metrics, these the burdens and the hurdles right now are baked into these clinical studies. And then we open these trials and half of them are behind schedule or people drop out and we wonder why. Well, it's because we're, we're making them far too challenging to, to, from the get-go, um, especially for certain populations where there might be you know, a lack of education about the process, maybe not a lot of trust, maybe there's a travel component, maybe there's financial costs, et cetera. So, multifaceted. And I want to dig into some of these concepts. I'm also hearing from our organizers, our second polling question, I think is ready. Um, could we push that out at this point? Here we go. I'll just repeat this to make sure everyone can read this. Uh, what is the first thing you think about for diversity in clinical trials you design or run? So we realize there's a lot of dimensions of diversity. We're curious as to your kind of first reaction as to the, the, the area that you want, you think you need to focus on first and foremost. Insert Je Jeopardy theme music here. <laughs> Should have results here in just a moment. Thanks for your patience, everyone, and thanks for uh, responding to our question. And there we are. All right. So maybe not surprisingly, but race and ethnicity being the, the far majority of uh, answers here in terms of the first thing people think about. A few people also said other. Um, maybe we can dig into that later on to, to uncover what was as part of those questions or that response. But Race, ethnicity. Okay, that's fantastic. Thanks everyone for participating in that. Um, so we, we touched on a few things. As you guys respond to some questions, it, it brings up other questions for me. And we talked a little bit about um, education, um, misconceptions. I think COVID has been really interesting, right? You have regular people in everyday walks of life talking about the Moderna vaccine trial or the Pfizer vaccine trial. For me personally, my mother now kind of understands what I do for work for the first time in like 25 years. Do you feel like, I'd like to maybe, Veer, maybe you can get us started with this. Do you feel like the COVID sort of pandemic we've seen over the last year that's kind of pushed clinical trials out in the forefront, in the news, um, a little bit more into everybody's daily life, do you think that's helped educate people a little bit around clinical trials or, or has it educated them enough? Yeah, I think um, yeah, I think the, the pandemic um, was able to shine the, the light on on several different areas of, of drug development, right? I think it was able to highlight the fact that um, you know the drug development process does take a certain amount of time and and resources, um, and I think. Um, I definitely feel that as the vaccine development projects were taken on, you know, uh, the right set of resources were deployed. I think quite a bit of at-risk decisions were taken in terms of, um, you know, kicking off manufacturing for, for some of these potential vaccines that were going through clinical trials. Um, and um, to, to answer your question, yeah, I think, um, I think there is much better visibility um, of clinical trials and what that means for the general population um, due to the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Jennifer, Tanisha, do you feel like, you know, there's, a, there's an opportunity here in front of us where the time is right or maybe the opportunity exists to kind of build upon this kind of pandemic, a little bit of awareness to really try to educate, inform, uh, dispel some misconceptions? Is this the time to do this? Yes, I would, um, I would think so. I think, um, as Deer said, this whole pandemic has really um, ripped the band-aid off of the diversity challenge and the, the, the equity challenge that we've had in healthcare in general. Um, and so if you consider 
um, clinical trials, that's a small, it's a large part of it, but it's also a small part of, you know, what people of diverse backgrounds have to deal with anyway. <clears throat> um, but it also shows that, like Tanisha said earlier, it was just a lack of education. Um, so I think now is the time for everyone to realize, or the companies, all of us to realize that I think the education needs to start from square one, going back to the basics, what are clinical trials? Um, what is each phase of them? What, what, what does it mean? Um, and including everybody in that conversation and then also including the diversity component in there, the cultural component, like who, how do I reach each and every target, right? So we're just, <clears throat> so many different mediums out there that we could use um, before we get to a specialized um, maybe app or, you know, cause it's, it's we love apps, <laughs> I love apps. Um, but I think just going back to the basic communications 101 and education 101 is imperative at this point, so. I have a couple more points, Scott. I mean, I'm just like you. So I think my parents and my family are, have just gotten to the point where they understand what I do in an average day. Yeah. And I still don't think they get it. <laughs> but okay. I, I want to say that, and I'll, I'll use my family as an example. You know, like even with what's happening with COVID, I'll receive text messages from my family um, that says, hey, did y'all hear about the vaccine? I'm not getting it. And here I am as a public health. You know what I mean? I, I'm in the field of public health and I have to dispel some of the myths within my own family. And these are individuals that are, I would say, uh, are moderately highly educated. Um, and, and I think, so I'll, I'll give the uh, negative of, I think, what's happening right now. And I think you all have hit it on the head about the positive. I think the opposite end of that is that people have access to too much information now that they don't understand. Um, so they'll read something and then they'll come up with their own conclusion. And then they'll go tell someone else after they form their own Google conclusion, you know, about what that actually means. And then these spirals of misinformation happen. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, one person came to me and said, hey, Tanisha, you know, I heard that there was a baby fetus used in one of the vaccines. How does that happen? They're trying to inject us, you know, so things like that, that I think we're doing a great job of letting people know, you know, this is the process now. But one of the things we also need to be very clear about is the reason that we were able to even get these vaccines that fast was because money was thrown into the system that traditionally may not be there. So, I, and it was able to reach people, you know, to make sure that they had a variety of individuals participate in different phases of the clinical trial process. So I think we have to be frank about, you know, how that process is, but understanding that people have access to information um, and it may not necessarily be adequate because it's not lay um, information. So I think it still goes back to, yes, this is awesome. You know, people are more aware, but how do we capture, and I think you have it right, Jennifer Veer, that this is the perfect time now that people are engaged to say, look, you know, this is what this looks like, but let's have an authentic conversation about how this process works. Um, you know, what are in these uh, specific vaccines so that people have a better understanding and they can cooperate, um, you know, on, a, on, a, on a, another level of cooperation. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. So this idea, interesting, there's, so we want to educate and we feel like there's a lot of misconceptions, but there could also be too much information if I'm hearing you correctly. And so this ties in, so I'm, I'm curious about, you know, how we educate people better. How do we educate minority communities? We also have a question from our audience that ties into this kind of information overload concept too. So let me read off the question from an audience member and let's see if we can address this um, what are your thoughts about how to introduce a trial to a newly diagnosed patient that is having so much information thrown at them simultaneously? How can site sponsors support these patients to ensure there's no coercion? Um, I guess this ties into education. It ties into an overload of information. I don't know if anyone has looked at a consent form lately. Sometimes they're, they're long and scary. Um, anybody like to take a shot at trying to respond to this question? Yeah, sure. I can um, <laughs> take a take a shot at it. Um, the first thing I think of is it's it's interesting because I'm um, kind of sitting on both sides of you know um, working with some of the pharma companies and also working with nonprofits on the ground with patients. Um, I think one of the effective things that's been catching on lately are the use of community health workers, right? So not just that term in general, but 
um, those people are individuals who know the person or are relatable to the person that they're speaking to. And so one of the partners that I work with um, uses a community health worker to work with the provider. So just having that person in the room with them while there's discussion about a clinical trial or while there's discussion about their medical care, I think has been really helpful. It kind of puts the patient at ease um, to see a familiar face there, to see a person who can kind of talk their language, speak their language. Um, and I think really involving the community in a much stronger way has been, um, has been helpful. I think the unhelp unhelpful side of this is, for example, with COVID-19, um, <clears throat> now all of a sudden it seems like, and this is something that I've heard, but now uh, you have groups who are going to pastors of churches to say, hey, push the vaccine, right? But it, that makes people leery. Why weren't they there before? You know what I mean? So I think it's just a subtle kind of um, thing to really have the patient work with someone who they trust. And then the, the provider also just spend time with them, spending time with them. I know it's there's a lot of administration behind all of that, <laughs> that, that uh, clinical care process. But I think the time and building a rapport with the patients along with the good care team, I think really, really helps um, for a person to um, receive the information about a clinical trial. Um, if they feel like they're being heard, um, for me in particular, if I feel like you're really listening to me and you're treating me like a person when you're communicating with me, then I'm gonna be very receptive to what you're saying to me. Um, so I think that's, I would pass this along to Veer and Samisha um, to, to add input, but those are thoughts. Anyone like to add on to that? You can go ahead, Mir. If you just... uh, yeah, so I think I just had, uh, you know, maybe just one quick comment. And um, it, it's just a, a reminder that uh, it is a choice to participate in research. And so I agree with Jennifer that it comes down to um, a level of trust and comfort um, by in moving forward with that decision. Um, and so, you know, the uh, when you have sort of the right relationship with your provider, I think that can facilitate that decision. So that's that's my quick comment. Tanisha? No, I think you all have covered um, everything for the most part. One thing that I'll add on the coercion um, part is that some of that could be taken care of in the institutional review board process. So. For example, um, for, as Beer mentioned this earlier, um, if somebody's receiving a biopsy, the IRB is going to understand um, that you may have to offer them an additional compensation for something that's so intrusive. Mm -hmm. However, if somebody's just coming in to participate in a 30 minute survey, you're not gonna be able um, to give them an $150 gift card. And I also think that goes back to Jennifer's main conversation um, that we talked about about barriers. I think in order for you to understand a patient and to understand the process of not um, forcing them to participate is you do need to have an engaging conversation and build a relationship with them to understand what their barriers are. Because if um, we do know that individuals that represent um, these, um, I would say, uh, people of color, um, individuals like that, they have all of these barriers. So if you're offering some of those in a clinical trial process, a lot of them will be engaged just because they want um, to have access to those basic needs. So I think that's a very important question. Um, and I think it all goes back to, again, um, Scott, including those individuals in that beginning part of the conversation um, so yeah. that they understand the process um, more thoroughly and then making sure that um, that process in the consent form, however long it may be, um, that it, it addresses um, coercion adequately and your staff also understands um, that process as well. That's great, thank you. So we talked a little bit about there being a lot of information. We talked a little bit about there's a lot of misconceptions and maybe not a lot of trust. Um, we've also talked about how it's important to include patients um, of a variety of backgrounds early on in the development of a study, in the design of a study, before we actually roll that out to clinical sites and cross our fingers and hope that patients actually enroll. Um, what are, are there any strategies that you guys have used or things that you think um, would help um, involve underrepresented populations early in a clinical trial? 
um, in a way that is authentic and, you know, well-meaning and transparent? Are there things that we can do to appropriately involve as opposed to showing up at a church on a Saturday saying, please enroll in this clinical trial? What are, what are real, you know, authentic ways to involve, you know, representatives from these communities up front in, the, in a study design? Um, I would say building relationships, it goes back to everything that everybody has already said. Um, and the relationships with, and, and that relationship I'm thinking is between the companies, right? So I know that there's a distance between the clinical trial company um, you know, and the teams and all of that. There, it, there's a wall mm -hmm. there, I understand that. But I think if, for example, a company would just really take the time to invest resources, when you're thinking about raising dollars for um, the actual clinical trial, there should also be top conversations about really raising dollars to reach the communities in impactful ways. Um, so that when you come down to trying to figure out what those barriers are, you already have the resources in place. Um, you've already studied um, what the needs are of that community. Um, and you are putting into position the same time you're doing preclinical work, you're putting in position all the cultural um, or diverse needs that they might, that you all might have to feel or a company or uh, um, organization might have to feel um, to make it accessible. Um, but I would say definitely um, strategy that I've used is really, I've never been with a, an organization that started in the preclinical phase. Let me say that, so I think that's huge. But the other thing is just really um, separating the two, right? So if you're working with an organization, just getting them to really understand the community and working with the community groups directly to say, all right, what is your population need? Let us help you with that. While, you know, we're doing this on our clinical side, these two are not together, but it's just simply showing the face of the organization, showing the heart of the organization and that showing that the companies really care about their community, right? And that they care about the resources, access to care, whether you're in a clinical trial or not and providing those community organizations with resources. And then also, you know, pushing those resources down to the patients directly themselves whether they are in trial or not. We really shouldn't even know if they are in trial if you're <laughs> working in the advocacy space within a, a biopharma company. But those are some of the things that um, I try to walk um, some of our partners through, you know, just engaging on a very basic, pure, um, holistic level. That makes sense to me. I mean, I think we, I, you know, I talk with biopharma clients every day and, um, Certainly, to me, it just seems to make sense logically, you know, instead of just trying to build a relationship for a clinical trial or to fill slots in a clinical study, you know, if, if this is really the area that you're going to be, your company is going to be pursuing, let's say developing a drug for sickle cell disease, you know, if you can start at that preclinical phase, it doesn't have to be expensive or take a lot of resources, but start to build those relationships so that a couple of years later, when you're actually reaching out to the community, they've been educated on your drug, they've been educated on your philosophy, you've kept them abreast of your plans. At that point, you know, again, these are your ultimate stakeholders, right? These are the patients that are going to sort of provide the data to help you get your drug approved. And they're ultimately going to be the ones to benefit from it. So it seems to me pretty obvious. Maybe it's not an immediate burning fire in front of someone that they need to quickly address. Maybe it's more of a something you're thinking a couple of years out, but to me, it makes a lot of sense. And I, and I feel like, you know, Tanisha, you do a lot of community outreach work. Um, you know, do you, have you seen good examples of this where companies have sort of begun this relationship building early on in a, in a way that you'd be proud of? Yeah, so I'll give you, um, just first off, I think one thing that we, we haven't talked about is representation. Um, and I think that embodies the comment that's in the Q&A right now um, from Harsha. The idea that, you know, we're talking about diversity today, but who are the panelists? You know, it's so important to have representation. So as you're approaching um, these different communities, as Jennifer mentioned, the idea is that your staff is representative of the population that you're trying to reach out to. Um, you know, it's important to make sure that you have that representation so that those individuals can jump in sometimes and serve as that community liaison, um, which is kind of the work that I do around community liaisons and making sure um, that they have access to communities and serve as the bridge of information 
um, between researchers and then the community members. And I think a, a lot of the times what I teach my students is I, we don't want to practice helicopter research. Um, and I think that's oftentimes what we're used to doing. And, and I'll explain that for, um, for those that may not understand. So helicopter research is this idea that as a researcher, um, I developed this wonderful grant. I'm really excited about it. I have all of these funds coming into the university. And then I go and get in my helicopter. I fly over to the community that I need to participate in my research. I never had a relationship with them. I never asked them what they needed. And I say, hey, will you complete these surveys for me? And lo and behold, they're so nice that they say, yes, I, I would love to participate, Tanisha. They give me their data. And instead of ever informing them of the results of that data, you know, I take that back on my helicopter and I go back to my university and take all of that money with me. Um, and then I write up a publication that they don't understand. So, I, you know, that's the whole helicopter um, research yeah. Uh, yeah. phenomenon, which is, you know, in the traditional research, let's be honest, that's what we practice. And so I think it, it's very important, as you mentioned, Scott, the idea that if you already know that you're going to be in this niche, or you're going to be in this space, why not form relationships with people? Um, and, and I think if we all understood that research is not about data, okay, research is about people. And I think that's what we forget. Um, and if we continue to think that research is about people, we'll always think about putting people first rather than data first. Um, and so, you know, and I have so much more perspective on that, but I know we're close to running out of time um, and would love to hear Veer's thoughts of, on that as well. Yeah, thank you, Tanisha. Um, yeah, I think for us, um, you know, it, it's, um, you know, gathering uh, site and patient feedback is part of our DNA. It's part of our product strategy. Um, and so as we look to, to develop solutions um, and cover specific indications, we are extremely mindful of making sure that we are getting those perspectives and we're getting those, uh, that feedback um, much earlier in the product development process. Um, and and to, to the panel's point, um, you know, it does take resources, but um, I feel it is, it is the right investment of resources to make sure you're having the right conversation at the right time. That's great. I, I just wanted to add one thing, Tanisha, thank you so much for bringing up representation. I just want to add one little bar on top of that that you just made me think of is representation. Um, going back to the first conversation about representation being someone who's relatable too, right? So I could come from, you know, um, just the culture of although I'm brown and be highly, I don't know, just highly removed from the, the, the population of people that we're trying to serve, right? And then that still doesn't do any justice to forming a good relationship. So I just wanted to say that one thing because that, that is, that's one of the biggest things I think I've seen a few times. Um, they, you know, a company will think, oh, it's a brown girl, let's hire her, right? <laughs> and then there's no relation to the community, no understanding of what the community really goes through and, you know, what their, their disparities are and things like that. So just thank you for bringing that up. That was great. And thanks, Veer. <laughs> Sorry. One example of something, uh, one example of um, something that was done in uh, a research that I was doing quickly. I was working in a community um, in Birmingham, a disadvantaged community right by the airport. Um, and we were asking them to identify what their needs were. When we came in, we were so excited. You know, we wanted to work on diabetes. And as they ranked what their needs were, the number one priority for the neighborhood was to get rid of stray, stray dogs. They had no care about diabetes. They had no care about anything else. Back to the conversation about, and Scott and Jennifer, you mentioned this, like if I can't get my basic needs, which is I have children that run around the neighborhood and they wanna be active, but we have stray dogs and we have to fear that they're gonna get bit. So that was their main priority rather than what we wanted to do as researchers. So I think going back to making sure that you're including the community in those beginning conversations, because we would have came in there with all these funds for diabetes and lo and behold, they just wanted to get rid of stray dogs. Yeah. <laughs> wouldn't even, wouldn't even resonate. Right. Um, fantastic. Um, 
Well, I think the, the helicopter research or helicopter researcher is a great concept for us to all kind of keep in mind when we're, you know, not only does it apply to a research project where you come in and out of a community, but I think it really applies to the way clinical trials are often conducted, right? So we have a, we have a clinical trial open. Hello, community. We're, we're, we're reaching out to you now, finally, and we want you to enroll and then we're going to fly away again, um, as opposed to really being there for the long haul and building those long-term relationships that I think are important. Um, I'm doing a time check. We are down to our last couple minutes. Um, this is a fantastic discussion. With each response you guys have, it makes me think of more questions to ask you. Um, we do have a third polling question that I would like to see if we could pose to the audience as we get near the end of our session. That's something we can pull up here. I think it's kind of an important one. Great, our third question here, and thanks again for participating everyone. I'll just read this out loud. How would clinical trial participation be impacted if there were diversity targets? Please choose one of these responses. So if we actually didn't just say, let's try to uh, make sure we have representation Let's try to make sure we're providing early access. What if we actually had numbers that were targeted? Would that direct us in a certain way? Give everybody there a moment to respond. Definitely need to have the Jeopardy music queued up for next time. I feel like the data is accumulating. Thank you everyone for participating. Well, as we wait on that data to show up, we're gonna to have to wrap up here shortly. Um, we do have slides. We have a couple slides that we presented earlier. We can make those available to any of the uh, audience members if they're interested in. Um, here's the results real quick of how would uh, diversity targets, what would they do? Number one response was it would encourage the allocation of more resources to achieving diversity targets. Um, the remainder of respondents think that it would increase participation. Nobody thinks that it would decrease participation or that it would have no impact. So maybe by setting diversity targets, our audience thinks this could help. It would help us achieve those targets. It might help us um, increase participation and maybe ensure we have some resources allotted. So that's fantastic. Thanks everyone for participating. Thanks also for the audience questions we've had. Um, we are at the top of the hour. I only have about 50 more questions to run by you guys. <laughs> um, I think the variety of your perspectives is really fantastic. There's a te technology angle here that we haven't had a chance to talk about today, but um, I'd like to thank all of our audience members for attending. And I'd really like to thank um, our organizers, Joan and Melissa at Syscript for helping us um, put on this webinar. But most of all, I really wanna thank Jennifer, Tanisha and Veer for uh, joining us for sharing your perspectives and for giving us some really good, kind of good sort of nuggets to hold on to and take back to our communities and to our companies and to our organizations. So thank you everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you again, amazing panel. I hope everyone has a fantastic rest of their day. All right, thank you, Scott. Thank you, Sister. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.